My sermon passage is John 1, verses 6 to 8, then it skips to 19 to 28, page 922 in the Pew Bible. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed, he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. They said to them then, they said to him then, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know, even he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. This took place in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The word of the Lord. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Let us pray a couple of prayers to set the stage and to set our hearts and minds for this passage. First, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, help us always to remember that it is you whom we behold in the weakened bodies and haunting faces of the hungry of the world. Grant that we not turn away, but rather that we may receive your blessing as ministers to the least of your brothers and sisters. Lord, they sleep in doorways, they sleep at home, they wear ragged clothes and carry shopping bags, they look like us. They use poor grammar and they smell. They have good educations and are well-groomed. All-knowing God, show us the poor, not just the ones who have been pushed aside in the wake of competition, but the ones who are losing self-confidence, the ones who are victims of systems they helped to build, the ones whose jobs no longer exist. Show us that there is also a poverty of the heart when saving is more important than sharing. Help us to find security in sharing all our resources so that through our total effort, we will have answered your call to be a friend in need. Amen and amen. Now, those prayers are from the United Church of Christ Book of Worship in the UCC archives from the papers of Robert V. Moss, who was president of the UCC when he prayed it on Ash Wednesday of 1975. And another one was by Paul B. Robinson, a retired UCC minister. Now, attribution is always important to me, but it's especially important for part of my message today. So there's some detail there. Now, a hymn, again, to help set the stage and our hearts and minds to follow our passage from the Gospel of John from cosmic to concrete. It's an obscure hymn, dating only to the 60s, which is pretty new for him. God of concrete, God of steel, God of piston and of wheel, God of pylon, God of steam, God of girder and of beam, God of atom, atom, A-T-O-M, God of mine, all the world of power is thine. Lord of cable, Lord of rail, Lord of freeway and of mail, Lord of rocket and of flight, Lord of soaring satellite, Lord of lightning's flashing line, all the world of speed is thine. Lord of science, Lord of art, <clears throat> Lord of map and graph and chart, Lord of physics and research, word of Bible, faith of church, Lord of sequence and design, all the world of truth is thine. God whose glory fills the earth, gave the universe its birth, loosed the Christ with Easter's might, saves the world from evil's blight, claims us all by grace divine, all the world of love is thine. 
Now, and now here's the footnote. God of Concrete, God of Steel, words by Richard G. Jones, music by Francis Westbrook, and it's in a hymnal called Hymns for the Living Church, copyright 1974, Hope Publishing Company, Carroll Stream, Illinois. How did I say Illinois? Oh, Illinois. Now why, <laughs> now why, why the specific footnotes? To get across a point. Because I wish the Gospel of John and Matthew and Mark and Luke had come with footnotes in the bib, a bibliography, so we could more easily read and interpret between the lines. We get the author's intent explained in text notes as well as footnote citations. In the seminary, I was known for my robust footnotes because they would always wind up being a third or half of the page. <laughs> but no, the Gospels came to us without paragraphs and without punctuation let alone references and citations. And so we do the best we can, guided together by the Holy Spirit, to hear the words of God in what we colloquially call the Word of God, the Bible, our Holy Scriptures. I believe it's true that it is in living the questions that we find more than answers. Guided together by the Spirit, we can be led to truth. Truth is different from a bunch of facts. The truth of today's passage, I believe, is in the shift from the cosmic to the concrete. It echoes the closeness of the lowering of holiness, the lowering of holiness in the incarnation at the very first advent in the holy birth of Jesus, to which we look forward at Christmas. This passage, I think, kind of demonstrates to us how to live between mountaintop highs and mundane, humdrum, everyday existence, which is most of our days. Well, here's the holy mountain, the cosmic throne, where John starts. John 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then again, some of the concrete, and I mean that as a metaphor for the everyday stuff, although there was concrete in Rome in the first century. There was a man, a man, a human being, sent from God, whose name was John. He came to bear witness to the holy divine light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. This man, John, contended with priests and Levites, Pharisees, other men who demanded to know who he was. Not Elijah, John said, not the Christ, not the Messiah, but one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And John was baptizing real, everyday people in real water, in a real river. It happened not in the cosmic heavens, but on the ground at Bethany. Now here's why I wish John and all the Gospels had footnotes in a bibliography. So we would know the exact source of the hymn or the prologue, if you will, that he starts with, in the beginning was the word. And we might know better in the scriptures where the writer's voice is and where other people and other sources are given voice in the Bible. It's hard to tell. That's why we have seminaries. No punctuation, no paragraphs, no capitalization, just strings of Greek words is what they have to work with. And I believe with certain Bible scholars that the Gospel of John was written as a drama and meant to be performed. There are clues all through it, if you know how to recognize them. There are some clear examples, though, when the writer actually breaks through the fourth wall, as they say in drama, and talks directly to the audience, to us as readers, to clarify a point. Here are some examples. You'll never be able not to notice these again, I don't think. Chapter 8, Jesus says, He who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. And the gospel writer interrupts, leans into the story as the narrator, and he says, 
they did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Isn't that interesting? Like a narrator, it moves the story along, but it does it from outside the story proper. In chapter 12, on Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on a donkey, and the crowds are welcoming him, which we remember on Palm Sunday, the narrator explains in verse 16, his disciples did not understand this at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that this had been written of him and had been done to him. Later in chapter 12, Jesus says cryptically, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And the narrator leans in and says in verse 33, he said this to show by what death he was to die. One more in chapter 20, and it's huge. At the empty tomb, before anyone had figured anything out, the narrator leans in and says to us in verse 9, For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. They didn't know. Now rising from the dead is as far from mundane, it's as far from the earthly world as it gets. Or it was, until the God of the cosmos rose dead Jesus, the holy man from Nazareth, until then, I believe holy man, with some notable exceptions, was pretty much a contradiction in terms. But now here we are, a whole people of God, or at least a bunch of us, a bunch of them, with a living hope. The incarnation spread, y'all. <laughs> the incarnation of Christ spread and it got to us. Man, you want to spark a revival? Think about that. The incarnation of the Holy spread to us. As it says in 1 Peter, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And 1 Peter goes on, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were no people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Marsha Riggs, a professor of Christian ethics, says this passage is all about incarnation, that is, Jesus as the human embodiment of eternal God. And it's about Christology, that is, Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. In other words, this passage shows us the bridge between cosmic Jesus and the eternal word and concrete Jesus as the human manifestation of that word who walked the earth, for whom John was the prophetic forerunner. John, a prophet only, not divine, at least not in the way Jesus is. Riggs says that by holding these verses together, we are reminded that the humanity and divinity of Jesus are not competing aspects of the one we confess to be the Christ. They're not competing. The challenge of understanding Jesus' identity is not, therefore, about how he is fully human and fully divine. You know, in seminary, we, you know, we struggle with this, of course, the whole concept. And what I came up with to explain uh, how Jesus can be fully divine and fully human is like a vinaigrette, <laughs> a holy vinaigrette. Think about it. <laughs> it holds itself together as one without, without losing its component parts. Worked for me. Professor, pretty impressed. I should write a book. <laughs> Sorry. The task, the task, rather than trying to figure that out, is to accept the gift of the incarnation as we confess its fulfillment in Jesus the Christ. And she says Jesus' incarnation makes possible the human ability to live in a relationship with one another in ways that we incarnate God's love for humanity. That's what it is. We, us. Now she makes three more points. 
One, during the season of Advent, these verses remind us of our identity and our role as witnesses who must testify to Jesus' birth in the midst even of the ever-encroaching consumerist claims regarding the meaning of Christmas. Like John, we are to witness to the light of Christ as a voice in the wilderness of 21st century consumerism. As voices in the wilderness, we must make a countercultural claim that dislocates the consumption of things even when we offer these things as Christmas gifts. Two, like John, we live as witnesses to the light of Christ, for the light of Christ is life. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people, it says. So as we testify to the light, we also embody that light as believers who reveal the light of Christ anew in the world especially during Advent. And that means we live to nurture our humanity, especially the capacity to love our enemies and to act humanely with compassion and justice. Finally, she says a faithful response to this passage and its moral imperative is summed up in a wonderful little song in African-American spiritual that I know we all know by heart. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Amen.